Be my best friend. Good morning. Uh, so as Verona was telling you, uh, this is one of the two opportunities that I will get to, uh, to address you. Um, the first of which right now, uh, essentially uh, what I'm going to attempt to do, and I know you've heard over the course of the impoundment process a number of different witnesses that were listed out as, as far as potential witnesses in this case. Uh, so what my intent here is to provide as much of a roadmap as I can through uh, those waters and help you to navigate sort of who these people are. <clears throat> and what relation they have to this case. We start with John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe uh, grew up in Braintree. He was 46 years old when he passed. He was the son of uh, John O'Keefe Jr. and Margaret or Peggy O'Keefe. He was a brother to Paul O'Keefe uh, and to his sister Kristen Furbush. Kristen uh, was married, and so John's brother-in-law uh, was a man named Stephen Ford, and they had two children uh, who were very young uh, in 2013. Now in 2013, uh, Kristen, uh, unfortunately, tragically, uh, passed away succumbing to, uh, to cancer uh, in November of 2013. Within months of that, uh, Mr. O'Keefe's brother-in-law and Kristen's husband, Stephen, uh, passed away as well. Now initially, uh, when John O'Keefe's sister passed away, uh, sort of the initial plan uh, for that situation was that uh, John O'Keefe was going to move in with Stephen Florbush and the kids and assist uh, as far as raising them. And then uh, when Stephen passed away a few months after his wife, uh, before those plans could be final, um, John O'Keefe then moved in uh, with his niece and nephew and assumed the parental role and assumed legal guardianship uh, with respect to both of those children. Now, he was assisted in this uh, by a great number of people within the town of Canton where the four bushes uh, lived uh, and where John moved into, uh, the home with the two children there. There were other parents uh, within the neighborhood, other parents within the children's age group. Uh, you'll hear from a number of them over the course of this trial, uh, but they include a Mrs. Kerry Roberts and a Mrs. Uh, Jennifer McKay. They helped Mr. O'Keefe out during those initial stages and, and during the time uh, that he uh, assumed this role. <coughs> he also got help from his work. John O'Keefe was a uh, proud member of the Boston Police Department, had been for many years. Uh, he had been a patrolman prior to uh, moving in with the children and assuming uh, this sort of role. Uh, the Boston Police Department helped him greatly as far as positioning him to more of a desk role, uh, working in the <coughs> sex offender unit. Uh, with more regular hours to sort of assimilate himself to this new life uh, and this new role that he has <coughs> uh, with these children. Initially, John O'Keefe lived in the house uh, with the kids. Uh, however, in 2018, uh, they moved into a new home, sort of a new home that they could have as their own. Uh, that home is located also within the town of Canton, sort of on the Stoughton side of Canton at uh, One Meadows Avenue. John O'Keefe raised these children, uh, assuming guardianship for them for about eight years. His niece, who was the elder of the two, was about 14 at the time that John O'Keefe died, and his nephew was about 11 years old at the time that John O'Keefe died. January 28, 2022. It was a relatively typical day. It was a Friday going into a Saturday of January 29th. Sort of typical in the sense uh, of most sort of suburban parents, there were a lot of activities, weekend sports, practices, games, things of that nature uh, that the O'Keefe and Furbush uh, family had to look forward to. One little difference uh, when it came to that particular day of January 28th and the 29th is the weather. So there had been predicted and there was going to be a snowstorm, an insignificant one, uh, a blizzard essentially was coming in overnight that Friday and the Saturday, uh, lasting through most of the day on Saturday the 29th. And as a result of that, most of those sort of typical, you know, weekend routine activities that <clears throat> would keep most people, including those within the town, can busy, have been canceled ahead of time. Everybody knew what was coming. Everybody knew, essentially, you weren't going to leave your house all that much the following day. Now, also on January 28th, Mr. O'Keefe had received some news in respect to his niece. So his niece and her best friend uh, were in eighth grade at the time going into high school in the fall of 2022. They had both applied to a private school called Bishop. 
and they both found out on the 28th that they had been accepted to that school. Uh, so the friend, as well as her father, a gentleman by the name of Michael Camerano, uh, who's uh, both he and his wife, Catherine Camerano, were friendly uh, with John O'Keefe. Uh, they had children around the same ages <coughs> as both John's niece and his nephew. And they had come over to their house on Meadows Ave that evening to celebrate the girls getting into that school. Um, the nephew of John, uh, the 11 year old, uh, was sleeping over a friend's house that night. He left that home sometime around 7 p.m. or so, got picked up, and, and went to sleep over his friend's house. John O'Keefe and Michael Camerano then uh, decided to travel out to a local establishment on Washington Street called C.F. McCarthy's Bar and Restaurant. Uh, you're going to hear testimony, uh, and you're going to see surveillance video, and you're going to see receipts and all kinds of things from variety of different establishments, all sort of located within Camden Center along that strip in Washington Street. Now, <clears throat> they get uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Camerano, uh, leave the girls at home. Uh, they then go to see if McCarthy is arriving there sometime between 7.30 and 8 p.m. They <clears throat> eventually uh, cajole another friend of theirs, Mr. Kurt Roberts, uh, to come out to the bar uh, and join them as well. And there's some other people that are located within the bar, including a Mr. James Sullivan, who we hear from, who was uh, present at the bar that night as well. Eventually, <clears throat> the defendant, Karen Reed, joins them at this establishment at C.F. McCarthy's, uh, sometime just before 9 p.m. Now, John O'Keefe and Karen Reed had met sometime in 2004. They had dated briefly during that time and, and reconnected sometime around March of 2020, around the time of the COVID-19 uh, sort of pandemic shutdown. They had started dating around that time period, or reconnected during that time period, and uh, the defendant had stayed at the house in Canton several nights a week. She had helped out uh, with the children. In the month or so leading up to Mr. O'Keefe's death, <coughs> the relationship sour. You will see text messages uh, between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed uh, to that effect. You will uh, hear testimony uh, from the children, uh, from John's niece and nephew, in regard to uh, things they observe within that relationship. And you'll hear testimony from, from other individuals as far as their observations or things that they uh, heard. Turning to January 29th, 2022. Just after 6 a.m., the Canton Police Department receives a 911 call from a woman reporting a male party uh, subsequently identified as John O'Keefe, found in the snow outside a residence at uh, 34 Fairview Road. At the time, as I had mentioned, the blizzards uh, that had been predicted was occurring, heavy snow, temperatures in the teens, uh, wind uh, bustling around. Officer Stephen Saras and Officer Stephen Mullaney of the Cannon Police were dispatched along with Cannon Fire and EMS, and you'll hear uh, from them in regard to uh, their response and what they observed uh, on scene. In particular, with Officer Saras, you'll uh, have as an exhibit, I anticipate, a uh, cruiser camera uh, video from his cruiser detailing or memorializing sort of his response uh, in the darkness, in the blizzard type conditions uh, as he's driving from the Cannon Police Station where he was located when he received the call. Uh, 234 Fairview Road. When they arrive there, <clears throat> they observe uh, three individuals, three females, uh, sort of off to the left side of the property. And when I say the left side of the property, I mean if you're standing out in the street facing 34 Fairview Road, off to the left side of the property, there's a flagpole, there's a fire hydrant, uh, there's some bushes. Uh, that is where Mr. O'Keefe is located. <clears throat> off to the right side of the property is just sort of the driveway and the mailbox and uh, other things that you'll become familiar with uh, through photographic evidence and other means through the course of this trial. The three females uh, that the officers observed there uh, were then identified as a defendant, Karen Reed, uh, Mrs. Jennifer McCabe, who had received a phone call earlier in the morning uh, from the defendant, as well as Mrs. Kerry Roberts, who had also received a phone call early that morning from the defendant. The several firefighters uh, from the Canton Fire Department you'll hear from in regard to their observations of uh, injuries, uh, abrasions, and lacerations to the right arm of Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, we'll hear their testimony in regard to swelling uh, of his eyes and other injuries that he observed. They observed uh, redness <coughs> from the cold that he had been lying out in uh, for some time. You'll hear the testimony from uh, the firefighters of Timothy <coughs> Nuttall, Anthony Fumati, uh, Matthew Kelly, Francis Walsh, uh, Katie McLaughlin, and Greg Woodbury. 
And at least from three of those uh, firefighters, you'll hear testimony anticipates uh, detailing statements that the defendant made to me when they had asked about the origination of some of those injuries. The defendant stated repeatedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Mr. O'Keefe uh, was then taken from the front lawn uh, onto what they call a scoop stretcher. As he's doing that, I anticipate you'll hear Ms. Roberts' testimony that despite the six inches of snow approximately that was on top of Mr. O'Keefe's body and the snow throughout the, the roadway, front yard, everywhere around where he was, there was grass underneath Mr. O'Keefe uh, where his cell phone was located underneath his body as he lay on that front lawn. He was then transported uh, by uh, firefighters Kelly, Flamati, and Nuttall, uh, as well as uh, the ambulance being driven by firefighter McLaughlin uh, to the Good Samaritan Medical Center. Once there, there are some observations, and you'll hear <coughs> testimony from Dr. Justin Rice uh, from that facility as far as uh, observations consistent with what I anticipate you'll hear from those firefighters. Uh, but then uh, there is a certain warming procedure that they go through trying to bring his body temperature up. Because when Mr. O'Keefe arrives at the Good Samaritan Medical Center, his body temperature is 80. And <coughs> after those resuscitative efforts prove unsuccessful, Mr. O'Keefe is eventually pronounced by Dr. Rice at approximately 7.50 in the morning. Shortly after that, when the defendant is then being driven away from the scene by Ms. Roberts, who uh, is now going to go pick up Mr. and Mrs. O'Keefe, John O'Keefe's parents, and Braintree, and then bring them to the Samaritan Medical Center in Brock, uh, the defendant makes some statements uh, of self-harm. As a result of that, she's then transported uh, to the Good Samaritan Medical Center as well uh, by two firefighters named Daniel Whitley and Jason Becker. And amongst the statements that they uh, gained from the defendant as they're having a conversation with her in regard to that, in regard to her treatment and diagnosis, she indicates uh, that the last time uh, that she saw Mr. O'Keefe, they had gotten into an argument before he had gotten out of the car in front of Fairview Road. Now, you'll also hear testimony from some of the other first responding officers from the Canton Police Department, including Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, Sergeant Sean Good, and Sergeant Michael Lent, in regard to their initial response, their <coughs> observations, uh, people that they spoke to, where they went, uh, and their ability to recover within these blizzard conditions that are still ongoing, uh, certain pieces of, of evidence that they located in around the area where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found. You'll also hear from Lieutenant <coughs> Charles Ray, Police Department, who was tasked with, at this point in time, uh, the Canada Police were unaware that, uh, that the nephew was over at sleepover. Uh, they weren't aware that Mr. Camerano had come over to uh, the residence on Meadows Ave and picked up the niece uh, and bringing her back to his house as she was left unattended uh, when the defendant left uh, to go looking for uh, Mr. O'Keefe. So unaware of that, they go do a well-being check at approximately 822 in the morning. And they also have a cruiser camera video uh, attached to their cruiser, and you'll see that video. Of, and when they pull into the driveway at Meadows Ave, uh, approximately 8.22 in the morning, they pull in directly behind uh, where eventually you'll hear Ms. McCabe uh, left uh, the defendant's vehicle after driving it from her house to Meadows Ave in search of Mr. O'Keefe. And uh, you'll have that, uh, foot, uh, that footage and you'll be able to see the back of the defendant's vehicle, specifically the right rear taillight of that vehicle. Now, you'll also hear testimony, as I mentioned, from the Cameranos, uh, from Mr. Roberts, uh, from Mr. Sullivan. Also, uh, they were all present uh, with uh, the defendant and Mr. O'Keefe at CF McCarthy's. Um, you'll hear testimony from another, a number of other individuals who were at the waterfall. The waterfall is a bar located across uh, the street, essentially, from CF McCarthy's on Washington Street in Canton Center, and somewhere that Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant went after leaving CF McCarthy's at approximately 11 p.m. or so. Now from that establishment, you'll hear from Rebecca Trayers, who was working as a bartender at the Waterfall that evening. You'll hear from a couple uh, named Nicholas and uh, Karina Polakaitis, uh, who were friends of friends, uh, who had known uh, Mr. O'Keefe uh, through their daughter around the same age uh, as, as Mr. O'Keefe and these. Mrs. Polakaitis had some conversation uh, with the defendant that evening, as well as herself and Mrs. McCabe at the Waterfall. She left around the same time as they did. Uh, she parked on Washington Street around uh, the same area as Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed did, specifically in Ms. Reed's car. And she observed Mr. O'Keefe and uh, the defendant walking toward the defendant's vehicle, and specifically the defendant walking towards the driver's side of the Now, you'll hear testimony from a Christopher and Julie Albert, 
were people who were at one point neighbors of uh, Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, they knew him uh, well from, from being neighbors uh, of him. Uh, Christopher Albert owns a pizza shop, also located within that Cannon Center uh, area. Mr. O'Keefe, earlier in the day of the 28th, had been into that pizza shop along with his nephew to get his nephew a slice. Christopher Albert and Mr. O'Keefe had some conversation regarding what they were doing that night, and it's Christopher Albert who actually texts uh, Mr. O'Keefe and indicates that they're over at the waterfall and that he should come over shortly before <coughs> Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant make their way from C.F. McCarthy's uh, over. Now, Christopher Albert left directly from the waterfall and went home. He lives sort of walking distance away uh, from them. Um, his wife, Julie Albert, had left earlier in the evening. There was a band playing at the waterfall that night. This is uh, Julie Albert started to get a migraine, and she left uh, before most of the group. Included within that group and sort of how uh, they came to the waterfall, the Albert family in particular, Julie Albert uh, went there along with uh, her sister-in-law, Nicole Albert, uh, as well as her uh, niece, Caitlin Albert, her niece's boyfriend, Mr. Christopher Morris, and they had had dinner at the Waterfall earlier in that evening. Now, Nicole Albert lives at 34 Fairview Road. She has a husband named Brian Albert, who's also a Boston police officer. Uh, Brian Albert had gone uh, with a friend of his, who's also in law enforcement, a, name, a man named Brian Higgins, and they had gone uh, separately, but had come home together uh, from a funeral for a uh, fallen uh, police officer in New York City. They came home early to sort of beat the weather, and eventually they meet up with Brian Albert's family at the Waterfall. Now, Tristan Morris, who was Caitlin Albert's boyfriend, uh, had left the waterfall at some point in the evening. He then returns later to the residence on Fairview Road and picks up Caitlin Albert, brings him home. All of this is in relation to Brian Albert and Nicole Albert's son, Brian Albert Jr., uh, whose birthday was coming up the following day, the day of the snowstorm on the 29th. So he had been back at the house at 34 Fairview while uh, his family was out at the waterfall. Uh, he had a number of friends that had come over uh, that evening to celebrate his birthday with him. Now, among those friends was uh, two individuals named Sarah Levinson and Julie Nagel, and they were at the residence at 34 Fairview for a good portion. Now, those individuals from the waterfall that leave and then come uh, to 34 Fairview, they do so sometime shortly after midnight. Shortly after midnight is when it starts to snow. Blurries are starting to come down, Snow was starting to stick to some degree to the road, to the front lawn, to the grassy areas uh, <coughs> around the town. Now, <clears throat> from that group, the group that goes back is obviously Brian Albert and Nicole Albert as they live there. Caitlin Albert, uh, because it's her parents and her boyfriend is picking her up. As well as uh, Jennifer McCabe, who is Nicole Albert's sister, uh, and her husband, Matthew McCabe. Um, they go back to that, and there's an open invitation to essentially anybody that's there. Um, John O'Keefe takes them up on that. There are certain text messages and phone conversations between John O'Keefe and Jennifer McCabe as to where this house is located, as he's never been there before. Uh, and then he and the defendant arrive in the defendant's vehicle to 34 Fairview. And <clears throat> once there, there are several witnesses from within the home that observe uh, the vehicle parked in. So I mentioned earlier there were two uh, females that were with Brian Albert Jr. at the house, one of them being Julie Nick. At some point, she had called her brother, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, for a ride home. He then gets a ride from his friend, uh, Ricky DeLantonio, uh, as well as uh, his Mr. Nagel's girlfriend, or Heather Max, uh, that's riding in the back of Mr. DeLantonio's uh, pickup truck. I say that because they arrive at Fairview Road around the same time as the defendant. Defendant is coming in from one direction. The pickup truck with the Nagel brother is coming in from another direction. The pickup truck that the Nagel brother is riding in flashes its lights, signaling the defendant to go. She goes first. They follow him behind, and lo and behold, they end up at the same house. They park the pickup truck somewhere in that right side of the property, facing it from the street in the area of the driveway, and the defendant in her black Lexus SUV parks a little bit further up. Different people from within the pickup and different people from within the house observe that Lexus SUV in one location, pull up a little bit further, and then pull up a little bit further until it's in the area of that fire hydrant, of that flagpole, uh, where Mr. O'Keefe is located uh, the following morning. Now, <clears throat> from their position, I anticipate the testimony that you're going to hear, 
is that Heather Maxson from that pickup truck observes uh, a male passenger and a female operator when the pickup truck operator flashes those lights that the vehicle is facing each other before they pull down the barrier. What you'll hear also, I anticipate, from uh, all three of those individuals in the pickup and Julie Nagel who comes out to the pickup to talk to the brother, uh, is that no one ever exits that vehicle. There are no footprints around that vehicle. There's no damage that they observed to that vehicle at that time. Again, it's just started to snow. Things aren't sticking uh, really too much at this point. Julie Nagel has a conversation with her brother, decides that she's going to uh, stay at the house longer, so the arrangements for a ride home, uh, and the pickup truck leaves uh, from that point. As they pass by, they observe a uh, female operator uh, matching what I submit as the description of the defendant. From all of those people within that house that evening, none of them at any point in time observed John O'Keefe come into the house. See the vehicle out front, they see the vehicle pull away, and they just assume that they left and that no one was coming. We'll hear testimony from other individuals who were at the house uh, that night, including uh, Colin Albert, who is Julian Christopher Albert's son. He's also the cousin of Brian Albert Jr., who is having people over for his birthday. He's leaving the house around the time that the initial people coming back from the waterfall, which includes the homeowners, uh, and Mr. Higgins are sort of coming into the house. At that point, uh, Colin Albert is leaving. He's getting picked up by a young lady named Allison McCabe, who is Jennifer and Matthew McCabe's um, dog, who's also friends with Colin Albert and also cousins of uh, Brian Albert Jr., who's uh, within the home celebrating his birthday. As I mentioned, you'll hear testimony from Matthew McCabe and from Jennifer McCabe in regard to their observations that particular evening, uh, both at the waterfall as well as uh, at the residence on Sierra View Road. And then you'll hear testimony in regard to a phone call. A phone call that Jennifer McCabe uh, receives from John O'Keefe's niece at approximately 4.53 in the morning. She answers that phone call, speaks to the niece briefly, and the niece hands the phone over to the defendant. Now, you'll hear testimony from uh, the niece as well uh, that about 4.30 in the morning or so, the defendant came into uh, her room uh, in a frantic state, uh, saying that uh, Mr. O'Keefe had not come home the night before. So initially, when the defendant is talking to Ms. McCabe, she indicates to Ms. McCabe that the last time she saw Mr. O'Keefe was at the waterfall. Eventually, as Ms. McCabe is waking up, she reminds uh, the defendant that she not only saw them leave the waterfall around the same time as herself, but also saw the vehicle, uh, the defendant's vehicle, outside of the home on Fairview Road. Eventually, the defendant, while driving around, and this will come in as far as other testimony and related testimony uh, as it develops, but she's driving around in that morning, she's calling a bunch of a uh, number of different people, friends of, of Mr. O'Keefe, uh, she's calling Mr. O'Keefe himself. She also calls uh, Ms. Roberts. So Kerry Roberts receives a call about 5 a.m. from the defendant indicating uh, that Mr. O'Keefe did not come home, indicating that he got hit by a plow or that he must be dead. Ms. Roberts then gets ready, Ms. McCabe is getting ready as they're all sort of planning to go out and, and look for Mr. O'Keefe and see if they can locate him. They call numerous times, you can see that within the text messages and the, the phone extractions from a variety of people's different calls throughout the course of this trial as well. So eventually the defendant comes to Ms. McCabe's home, um, indicates at some point uh, prior to that that she has a cracked tail. Ms. McCabe then gets in the driver's seat uh, due to the defendant's frantic state. Ms. Roberts is there as well. Ms. Roberts follows Ms. McCabe driving the defendant's vehicle back to Mr. O'Keefe's residence on Meadows Ave, checks on the niece. Uh, the defendant then shows uh, both Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe uh, the damage to her right rear taillight, which is uh, essentially missing uh, a number of different pieces uh, from that right rear taillight. They then proceed off uh, to drive and see if where they can if they can locate Mr. O'Keefe. The defendant is insistent that they go to that residence on Fairview Road. Uh, again, they're driving down there in the dark, in the snow, in the wind, in the blizzard. As they approach uh, towards that residence, there is one person, um, so they're seated within the vehicle, and this is Ms. Roberts' vehicle, where she's driving. Mrs. McCabe is in the front passenger seat, and the defendant is in the rear passenger seat. The defendant is the only one who sees Mr. O'Keefe yells and screams at Ms. Roberts to stop the vehicle. Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe, I anticipate, will testify that they did not see Mr. O'Keefe, not only as they were driving past him, 
but even after they got out of the vehicle until the defendant gets out of the back seat and makes a beeline essentially right over to where Mr. O'Keefe's body is found. This is the cave and then dials 911. Uh, and shortly after that is when the officers and the cave firefighters uh, arrive on scene. Now, <clears throat> while they're waiting there, at approximately 6.23, 6.24 a.m., uh, during the conversation uh, with the defendant, the defendant uh, asks uh, Ms. McCabe to uh, look up on her phone how long someone has to be out in the cold uh, to die from hypothermia or something to that effect. And you'll hear some dispute as to when that uh, search was made. And you'll hear testimony from three different forensic extraction experts, as you Nicholas Carino, Ms. Jessica Hyde, and Mr. Ian Whitford, who uh, you'll hear about a lot of these things called extraction reports uh, from cell phones. And the extraction reports are done with a program called Celebrate. And Mr. Whiffen is someone who writes that software for Celebrate. I anticipate you'll hear from each of their testimonies that that Google search that was done on Ms. McCabe's phone was done at the same time frame that she indicates the defendant requested her to do it, and that at 6.23 and 6.24 morning. You'll hear <coughs> testimony from Ms. Roberts, Ms. McCabe, the firefighters, and the uh, responding uh, Kent police officers about a repeated phraseology uh, that the defendant uh, stated while there, asking again and again uh, in regard to Mr. O'Keefe, is he dead? Is he dead? You will also uh, hear testimony, as I indicated, about sort of treatment that she received at the Good Samaritan Medical Center, and that would involve testimony of Ms. Daisy Ormsef, Ms. Kathleen Wilford, and the Dr. Gary Fowler. You'll hear testimony from a number of different analysts uh, from the State Police Crime Lab and from some other uh, laboratories as well. Um, included within that will be a Mr. Nicholas Roberts, and Ms. Maureen Hartnett, uh, Mr. Andre Porto, uh, Ms. Ashley Vallier, and uh, Ms. Uh, Christina Hamp, uh, those all being from the State Police Lab. You will hear testimony uh, in regard <coughs> to an incident which occurred earlier uh, in January, right around New Year's. Uh, Mr. O'Keefe, the defendant, and the children have been invited with a much larger group, approximately 70 people or so, to uh, spend New Year's in Aruba. Uh, this is a trip that was organized by a friend of Mr. O'Keefe's named Laura Sullivan. Uh, we'll hear a testimony from her, as well as from her sister, uh, Miss Marietta Sullivan, as well as you'll hear testimony from uh, the two children in relation to this. And essentially, day two or so of this trip, uh, Marietta Sullivan, the sister of Laura, is walking through the lobby and she runs into Mr. O'Keefe. This is someone she refers to as Godfather because John O'Keefe is also the godfather of Laura Sullivan's uh, son. <laughs> runs into him in the lobby, uh, gives him a hug, and is sort of pointing him in the direction of, of where she believes he's going into his room. The defendant is in the area. The defendant starts yelling and screaming and swearing uh, at Ms. Sullivan. Ms. Sullivan responds in kind. Uh, and essentially, for the most part, uh, the Sullivan sisters uh, see very little of uh, Mr. O'Keefe uh, throughout the re remainder of their trip uh, to Aruba. Yeah. And we also hear testimony from the children that shortly after this, or immediately after this, uh, there is an approximately 20 minute screaming match uh, going on between Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant within their hotel room in front of the children. Now, you'll also hear testimony from the defendant's uh, phone in regard to, and from uh, another individual's phone, in regard to that Aruba trip, in regard to text messages of an amorous nature that she had uh, with Mr. Brian Higgins, who was at the waterfall and also at the residence on 34 Fairview because he was friends with the homeowner, uh, Brian Albert, but he was also friends with Mr. O'Keefe and had also met uh, the defendant. And throughout the course of those amorous text messages, there is uh, references that the defendant makes to uh, that incident in Aruba, as she uh, purports it to be uh, Mr. O'Keefe cheating on her. Uh, she insists that he was making out with Marietta Sullivan in that lobby as opposed to uh, her giving him a hug. It makes repeated reference uh, to that within the content of uh, those text messages uh, as well. Now, you'll hear testimony from a number of different other individuals, Mr. Michael Trotter, uh, who has a supervisory role with the Canton Department of Public Works. You'll hear from Mr. Lewis Jutris, uh, who has a supervisory role with regard to IT, uh, in regard to certain uh, video uh, that was recovered uh, from the town of Canton, as well as from a uh, temple located uh, along the route that the defendant traveled 
uh, both away from Fairview that evening as well as uh, to Fairview from the waterfall, away from Fairview uh, to Mr. O'Keefe's residence on Meadows, and then later in the morning uh, at five o'clock. Because if you recall, uh, Mr. McCabe, I anticipate, would testify that she receives the call from the defendant about 4.53 in the morning. Uh, the defendant uh, then drives around Canton for some perceptible half hour or so period of time prior to even getting to Ms. McCabe's house. And <clears throat> what I submit the evidence, or what I anticipate the evidence will show based on sort of the tracking of her phone records, uh, testimony you'll hear from Lieutenant Brian Tully of the state police uh, from these bulky records and RTT accounts. Uh, that the defendant, while she's using her phone, is uh, driving in the direction of Fairview Road prior to going uh, to Mrs. McCabe's house where she meets Mrs. McCabe and Ms. Roberts. Now again, <clears throat> you'll hear testimony from a number of different uh, troopers who were involved in the investigation. Uh, with regard to this case, you'll hear from Trooper Michael Proctor and Sergeant Gary Buchanan of the State Police. Uh, you'll hear from Lieutenant Brian Tull. You'll hear some testimony from Trooper Joseph Paul, who's in a specialized unit within the state police called PARS for short, but essentially a collision analysis and reconstruction section uh, within the Massachusetts State Police. His examination of the vehicle, his examination of the scene, his examination of specifically some Toyota texture, because Lexus is uh, essentially owned by Toyota or vice versa. Uh, so there is some data that he's able to recover from that and back the vehicle up based on its known locations and travel. He cycles and essentially opines, uh, anticipate he'll opine that uh, around 12.45 uh, in the morning when the vehicle was in front of the residence on Fairview, that for some perceptible period of time, that vehicle travels over 60 feet in reverse at over 20, approximately 24.2 miles per hour. <clears throat> now, you'll hear testimony, as I said, from a number of uh, different uh, troopers, as well as uh, from a number of different analysts uh, from different labs. Included within that is Ms. Maureen Hartnett, uh, who collected items uh, from the vehicle, uh, the defendant's vehicle, including the taillights, uh, sort of housing from that vehicle, pieces of the taillight that were discovered uh, in sort of the front grass, in the front street area. Uh, there is a specialized team called CERT Team. Uh, you'll hear from Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara, uh, who has a supervisory role in relation to that. And then later on that day of the 29th, he, along with Lieutenant Tully and a number of different members uh, from his search team, were searching for evidence within the mounds of snow uh, in front of that house, as the blizzard is still ongoing at this point through sort of the afternoon hours. Among the items that they locate is a sneaker. When Mr. O'Keefe is transported to the hospital, he's found to only have one sneaker on his, on his feet. They find the other sneaker uh, in that area of the body. They find uh, various pieces of taillight. And as is wont to do uh, over the course of the following days, uh, the temperatures rise, uh, there's a rainstorm that comes in, and the snow melts. And over those successive days, there are additional pieces of taillights uh, that are eventually discovered in that area of the front lawn in the street. Now, <clears throat> from these uh, different pieces, um, it's hard to also uh, locates a cocktail glass uh, that's located on the bumper uh, or the rear uh, area of that scene, and she locates a uh, human hair on the back of that uh, defendant's vehicle as well. Now, the cocktail glass on the bumper, you'll also see uh, surveillance video from the waterfall. And Mr. O'Keefe is observed on that surveillance video, essentially walking out of the waterfall with a cocktail glass in his right hand. The same right hand uh, that has uh, minor injuries to it, and the same right hand that's attached to his right arm that has the abrasions and lacerations uh, that are observed uh, by the paramedics that are observed by the doctors at Good Samaritan and are observed uh, by the medical examiner as well. You'll hear testimony from another analyst at Christina Hanley about the forensic uh, consistency between a drinking glass that was in the defendant's bumper and the drinking glass pieces uh, that were found uh, on scene at 34 Fairway. You'll hear uh, her testimony in regard to uh, pieces of red and clear plastic that were microscopic in size that were found within Mr. O'Keefe's clothing. Uh, consistent, uh, in her opinion, I anticipate she'll testify with the same pieces of plastic contained within the defense tail. You'll hear from an Ashley Valley uh, who works for the lab as well, uh, and how she fit the various pieces of broken taillight from the scene together and over that taillight housing, uh, finding them to be consistent with each other as well. You'll hear testimony from Andre Porto, who's the, uh, essentially DNA analyst uh, for the lab, and samples that were uh, DNA samples that were taken from the taillight from the clothes of Mr. O'Keefe and the broken drinking glass uh, that were consistent uh, with Mr. O'Keefe. 
Those items were also sent, uh, the tail light uses, uh, the tail light uh, DNA was also sent to an independent lab, uh, Bodie Technologies, located in Northern Virginia. And you'll hear from an analyst there, Mr. Nicholas Bradford, indicating that the uh, DNA on the defendant's tail light, uh, in his opinion, is consistent with that of uh, Mr. O'Keefe and inconsistent with Trooper Proctor and Sergeant Buchanan, uh, who were the two preliminary investigators uh, and primary investigators when it came to this case. You'll also hear from this test chart from that Bodie <coughs> Laboratories in regard to some mitochondrial DNA uh, that she uh, examined in regard to that hair uh, that Ms. Hartnett found on the bumper of the car, in her opinion that it was consistent with that of Mr. O'Keefe as well. Now, lastly, you'll also hear from Dr. Irene Scordibello and Dr. Renee Stonebridge of the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in regard to their various examinations. Uh, Dr. Stonebridge is a neuropathologist. She essentially examines uh, brain findings. Dr. Irene Scordibello is a forensic pathologist uh, who uh, does the sort of uh, autopsy and medical examination of Mr. O'Keefe's body. And you'll hear about the variety of sort of injuries that she observed over Mr. O'Keefe's body um, from it. In particular, you'll hear testimony in regard to a laceration to the right back of his head. You'll hear testimony in regard to an initial sort of skull fracture that occurs to the back of his head, and that sort of irradiating skull fracture that goes uh, throughout uh, his skull, which then leads to a subdural hemorrhage, or essentially bleeding uh, on the brain and then swelling in the brain, which then causes a condition called ecchymosis which then sort of leads to the swelling of uh, both the Mr. O'Keefe's eyes that was observed uh, by the initial response. You will hear uh, various testimony about uh, sort of issues in regard to his pancreas and how that's indicative of hyperplasia. Now again, as I said, this is the first of two times that uh, I have an opportunity to, uh, to address you directly. And I thank you very much for your attention today, and I thank you for the participation of your close attention as we go through all of the witnesses and all the evidence in this case. That second time that I do get to address you, what I'll be asking you to do, based on the evidence, and again, as the Court has instructed you, you are the sole arbiters of the facts of this case. You are the ones who find what the facts, and I reiterate that, the facts, and what the evidence uh, demonstrates in this case. And what I submit to you at that time, that second time, is that the only true and just verdict based on that is that the defendant, Karen Reed, is guilty of murder in the second degree, striking the, uh, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, with a car, knocking him back onto the ground, striking his head on the ground, causing the bleeding in his brain, swelling, and then leaving him there for several hours in a blizzard with temperatures in the teens, wind swirling around, snow piling up on his body until she comes uh, with Mrs. McCabe and Mrs. Roberts uh, just after 6 a.m and that she is also guilty of vehicular manslaughter, um, operating under the influence of liquor, and that she is also guilty of leaving the scene after causing death. Thank you very much for your time.